You want me to start with the first no, I'll, day? I'll, I'll okay. introduce you first. Okay. okay. All right, this is an interview at the Public Library Center Mariches, New York. Uh, it is March 9th, 2004, 9.15 a.m. Uh, the interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Bert Mooseman. I'm was born in Brooklyn, New York, on July 22, 1923. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I attended public school in Brooklyn. I attended Brooklyn Technical High School, and I attended Columbia University School of Architecture in the evenings at that time for two years uh -huh. when I left to enter the service. Okay. Do you remember where you were and uh, your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, very definitely. I was with my family visiting my grandmother in a hospital, my father's mother in a hospital in Brooklyn. And the news came over the radios in the hospital room. And my great uncle was visiting from Nova Scotia. And he was a very outspoken man. He was a professional bootlegger. <laughs> and he turned to me and he said, Bert, what the hell is this? What's this war all about? And I said, Uncle Ike, the Germans have invaded Poland. Poland? They invaded Poland? I said, yes, Uncle Ike, they invaded Poland. And he turned to my father. He says, Willie. I thought all the Pollocks was in Canada with me. <laughs> and we all grinned and after a while we left there and we went back to our house in Queens. And a few months later I got my draft notice. Mm -hmm. So you were drafted? I was drafted and I was drafted in uh, June of 1943. Okay, um, where did you go for your induction and your basic training? The very first day was very, very important, and it what happened symbolized to me my whole army stay. Mm -hmm. We all took the oath. We stood there. My mother was in the audience. It was the, the Lois Valencia on on uh, Jamaica. Avenue in Queens, a very well-traveled shopping area, and she was crying. I saw her in the audience. We were up on the stage, and after we took the oath, World War I noncoms with campaign hats got us in line and walked us to the Long Island Railroad, which was just a few blocks away. And we all got in cars, and we sat down in the seats, which were turned any which way. They weren't turned in one direction. And we sat, and we sat, and we sat for about a half hour, an hour. And finally, one man, a big man, I'm 6'3", he must have been about 6'6". Six, six. At that time, I was 185 pounds. I was a football player. He looked like he could take on a whole football team, this guy. He got up and he said, where are we going? And everybody looked at him and everybody was quiet. And he got up again and he says, I want to know where we're going. And I, an Eagle Scout, Scout Master of my troop, I got up and I said, I don't know where we're going, but we're headed, we're pointed east. This train is going to go east. He says, how do you know we're going east? I said, well, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and the sun is over there. It's rising, and we're pointed into the sun. What does that mean? I says, well, the sun rises, sir, in the east. Are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure the sun rises in the east. He says, does it always rise in the east? I said, yeah, it always rises in the east. 
Are you absolutely sure it rises in the east all the time? I said, yeah, I'm sure it always rises in the east all the time. And then he held a fist up the size of a basketball underneath my face. He says, I'll look you up if it doesn't rise in the east. And we all sat down and we all looked at each other and the guy next to me and said, this is the army. I said, yeah, this is the army. <laughs> and we went to Camp Upton, which is east of Jamaica, mm -hmm. where we were outfitted with a basic uniform, but no shoes. They did not have shoes. We had to wear our civilian shoes. And I go there regularly now to concerts and meetings and lectures at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Mm -hmm. And as I drive in there, I think of those days where they took us out, 500, 700, 1,000 of us. Half of us would have shovels, half would have picks. And we'd put the shovel or the pick over our shoulder and we'd march. Left, right, left, right, left, right. And these World War I non-coms were our drill instructors. Now they were all veterans of World War I. They were veterans still, of they World were still War in the Army. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, they were still in the Army. And the commissioned officers, majors, lieutenant colonels, were all World War I officers. The commanding officer, a bird colonel, a full colonel, excuse mm -hmm. me, a colonel. He was a World War I officer. And uh, being what I am, I couldn't help it. I got a pick and a shovel. When it came time to pick, I held the shovel up. When it came time to shovel, I held the pick up. So I did no work. I just stood there. After the second day, this colonel came over to me and said, what's your name? He said, N soldier, which is the way you, they identify you in the Army, at least when I was in the Army. And I gave my name, rank, and serial number, Mooseman, private, my serial number, 32974-35, sir. He says, I'm making you a sergeant. He called over this buck sergeant, as oh, he was a Staff sergeant, I think. He's making this man a sergeant. The sergeant asked the colonel, What are you making him a sergeant for, Colonel, sir? He says, Anybody who scores like this guy can, we want him on our side. <laughs> and that was. And then I was sent from there to our first, my first assignment, the 70th Engineers at Fort DuPont, Delaware, which was a light ponton company where they built bridges which I have a photograph here of one of the bridges that we built there. Now where was that built? It was built, I think, in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Mississippi okay. or on the Delaware. And while I was there in the 70th, I was sent to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to the Evinrood plant and taught repair and service of upward motors. Now, when was this photograph taken? 43. And then I was transferred around and I was sent to OCS where I didn't stay there too long. And then I went from there to the Army ship AK Lyman and from the AK Lyman to the Richard R. Arnold and that was it. I stayed there till the end of the war. I spent 
quite a bit of time. And when I was in Mississippi, this photograph was taken on my birthday in 43. I was 20 years old. Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Camp Shelby. We did about six, seven, eight landings with the Lyman, with the, with the Arnold. Mm -hmm. And the major stop was Okinawa. We were there from the very beginning to the very end. And the one thing that impressed me, besides the typhoon, which we were offshore in, was the cleanup. All forces had to partake in the cleanup of Okinawa, which was, I don't know if you know about it, it uh -huh. was the major campaign uh -huh. of the Pacific. We lost over 16,000 men on Okinawa. Uh -huh. We were on the beach cleaning up everything, particularly the mines that the Japanese had sown. And there was a Hey, what do we do about this? And I looked over, and there was this little girl with a reinforcing rod in her hand, about five feet long, and a baby strapped on her back. And she was going like this. Meaning she wanted food. And the guys would go over to her and she'd swing this rod at them and they quickly would get away from her because a reinforcing rod can really hurt you. Mm -hmm. And they'd throw the food on the ground five, six feet away from them and she would go over, pick it up and reach behind her and feed this. It turned out to be a boy, a little boy, five, six months old. And the odor from this these two little kids was just horrendous, the smell of the human feces. And I thought, what are we going to do? We can't let this little child just wander around this beach like this. And this is what they looked like. This photograph was taken by an army photographer, and I got him to give me a copy. So, I got one of the guys, I spoke to him, I said, throw a big pile of open spam right in front of her. And when she bends it down to pick it up, I'm going to grab her and dump her into the water, which was right on, right near the bay. And she bent down, I grabbed her around her, she was a strong kid, and I just grabbed her and jumped right in the water. We were in the water all the time. Mm -hmm. And I rubbed her to get rid of that smell. It didn't do any good. The, the odor was just horrible, horrible. And she screamed and punched and she, other guys came over and ripped out, ripped the reinforcing rod off her hands. And I thought, what the hell am I going to do now? And I looked up and I saw the United States Army Hospital ship Hope out a couple of miles. And I said, stupid. And I called out. They brought over one of the small landing craft and still beating the hell out of me. I got in the landing craft with her, still holding her and the little boy in my arms. We went out there. We went to the main gangway. I went up the gangway and there was a nurse in charge. She took one look at this baby and she said, give me that baby. And she took the baby and no screaming, no hollering, took the baby and just disappeared with her into the hospital ship. Never saw them, never heard of them again. But it was truly what wars can be. Wars are a horror of people, not of 
politicians of guns. And I thought of Okinawa about a week after the World Trade Center. I went down there. I worked on those two towers for about five years for the company I worked for for 24 years. And the smell of Okinawa was at the World Trade Center. I don't know if you know about it, but at Okinawa, the Japanese and the Okinawans who were loyal to them went into caves mm -hmm. by the tens of thousands. They went into the caves of Okinawa. And our infantry stood at the mouth of those caves and flushed them with just hundreds and hundreds of gallons of gasoline and with with uh, with uh, flamethrowers flame mm -hmm. to ignite the gasoline. And the whole island was just smelled of burning flesh. The whole island. And that's what the World Trade Center smelled like that burning flesh. And I sat down on a curb there and I thought of Okinawa and the World Trade Center and those young, young kids who I saw, used to watch at lunchtime coming out of the World Trade Center. But the big thing at the end of the war was we went from Japan, we landed, we came into Japan on the day that MacArthur and the Japanese signed on the Missouri. We watched them in Tokyo Bay on the deck of the Richard R. Arnold. We, everybody on our ship, the, the whole, nobody was in the engine room. Everybody came out on deck. And I was fortunate enough to be on the bridge with the captain of our ship, who was a first lieutenant. Captain of a ship, a first lieutenant. And we watched it, and... How close were you? Very close. He was oiny, and I was boiked. <laughs> he was a marblehead fisherman, and what a sailor he was. He was a sailor. He's passed on. He's up in sailor's heaven now. But we watched it, and we couldn't get over it when MacArthur signed and the Japanese signed. And then we went ashore. We went the most absolute gorgeous, beautiful Japanese destroyer. We were told to tie up right alongside of it. We tie up alongside this Japanese destroyer and we were dumbstruck. The Japanese destroyer had the same exact 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns that we had on our ship. Both force 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. And we went, we crossed over and we looked at them and we shook our heads and we all said, what? I won't use our language. It's not fit for this video. <laughs> Good gosh almighty, what on earth is this? That they have the same guns we have. The same exact guns. Well, to make a long story even shorter, 30 years go by, my son, Joe, is born, bred, educated, gets married, and moves to Sweden. <laughs> Marries a Swedish woman, a dentist, meets her on a mountain in Greece. Can you beat that? Meets a, Greek, uh, meets a Swedish dentist on a mountain in Greece, moves to Sweden, and has children. Three, son, three grandsons I have with him in the harbor. And they live in this small town, Carlsborg, Sweden. And 
I wait a year or two until things are quieted down and I go visit them. One son is born, the oldest, Elias. And they get in a car with them and they're showing me around the town. It's very, it's a military base. And they show me around and driving around and all of a sudden I look up and I scream at my son, stop the car, Joe. He stops the car, what's the matter, Dad? You don't feel well? Your MS bothering you? I says, it's not my MS. Look at that sign. He says, oh, that's Beaufort's. He says, what is Bofors doing here? He says, Bofors is manufactured in this town, Dad. I says, Bofors is manufactured here in this town? I want to see. What do they have? He says, it's a museum. They have all their weapons here on, his, on, a, on display. And I had the door open. I was on my way out, and his wife got all upset. Her family goes back four generations working for Beaufort. My son married a woman whose family made the gun, probably, that I might have fired thousands of rounds and the Japanese fired thousands of rounds, that the Germans fired, that the Italians fired, that everybody fired. And it really was strange, but I'm mixing up the two things, mm -hmm. but it's both wars and it's yes. the war. Yeah. But getting back to the war, the war ends and we're, we're in Tokyo, we're in, excuse me, we're, on, we're on, in Okinawa, and we go from Okinawa to San Francisco, and Ernie, my friend, he says, Moose, my, my nickname, Moose, he says, I'm going to give you a great honor, you, ah, the hell with it, to you, son of a bitch, I'm going to give you a great honor. I said, what is it, Ernie? I didn't do anything wrong lately. He says, you are going to take this ship, the Richard R. Arnold, under the Golden Gate Bridge and into San Francisco Bay. Don't screw up, Bert. Don't screw up, Moose. Don't screw up. You're going to bring us home. The last day from Honolulu, which was, was about a week and a half from, from Japan to Honolulu and about five days from Honolulu to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I stood there and we went under the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, again, the whole crew, everybody was out on deck watching as we went under the Golden Gate Bridge and into San Francisco to a dock not far from the Embarcadero. And we docked and it was engine off, zang, cling, cling, and that was the end. And we, from there we got to the Presidio. We were there for about five days and we got on freight cars. Freight cars. And we went five days by freight car to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Now, were there any seating facilities on them or you just had to sit on the floor? Or? Four high. Steel bunks. No mattresses. Steel. Steel. Just steel springs, no mattresses of any kind, just steel springs for high. And we, were, we didn't care what happened. The sanitary facility was a hole of, with a five gallon bucket over it, a hole in the floor of the freight car. That was it. No water. They would stop, every stop, they would put up five five gallon cans of water. That was our, that's what we had. And it took 10 days, 10 days of that. Along the way, the homebound people were selling things to us. Two bucks for a quart of milk. 
two bucks for vegetables, to two bucks for apple, anything they could sell us. We were stuck, we had to buy it. And finally we got to Fort Dix. We were discharged, and it's just as if it was yesterday. This was May of 1946. I called my folks, my old man, he said, where the hell are you? I told him. What train are you taking? I told him. He says, we'll be there. I says, Pop, you don't have to be there. I'll get on the train. I'll come to, I'll come to 179th Street. You can be there, you know, 179th Street and Jamaica Avenue and Queens. You don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> we probably passed there yesterday. <laughs> yeah, in your travels. I'll go, I'll go to the last stop. He says, we'll be at Penn Station, your mother and I. And I got on the train at Fort Dix. I got to Penn Station, and there they were. They were old people. They had aged tremendously in the time I had left and time I came back. Two old, old people they became. And I got in the car, and not a word was spoken on the trip from Penn Station to our house in Queens. And I got to my house, I took my barracks bag, put it on my shoulder, got inside the house, walked up the stairs, there was my bedroom, with my bed. And I dropped the barracks bag, took my clothes off, laid down on my bed, looked up at the ceiling, and I went to sleep in my bed for the first time in 37 months. And the next thing I know, somebody was kicking the bed. Get up. We're going for chinks. Come on, get up. And then I fought. And I got up and shook my head. I didn't know where I was. And I put my feet down on the floor. And first thing I did was, I'm going to get dressed. And I'm looking for my barracks bag, my barracks bag, no barracks bag. And I'm looking, looking, looking for my clothes, my Eisenhower jacket with all of my ribbons and all the crap and everything. Nothing's there. And I let out a holler, hey, Ma, where's my clothes? And I hear a voice, in the garbage. Everything you brought home. I went through everything, all the money, all the valuables, everything I took out, but everything is in the garbage. I don't want to hear or see anything about your army again, ever. It's in the garbage. Your father took a jacket. He says it's a good jacket. When you go to work for him in the, in the cold weather, you can wear that jacket, which I did, a field jacket. And I hollered down the steps. What do I wear? She says, look in the closet. I opened the closet door. There were sport jackets, which I'm wearing right, which I'm wearing, not these, but uh -huh. similar sport jackets, slacks, shirts. Then I opened a, a dresser drawer. There was underwear. There was socks. There was everything. No, there was no underwear. I couldn't find the underwear. Then I came out and I said, Ma, there's no underwear. She says, look in the third drawer. And then she says, take off that shit colored underwear. I was wearing GI underwear, you know, the khaki underwear. And throw that down here. I don't want to see it again. I says, OK. And I took it off, changed into white underwear, threw the khaki underwear down the steps. And that was my homecoming. <laughs> And that just about sums it up. Now, do you remember uh, your reaction when you heard about the atomic bombs dropping in Japan? <laughs> oh, do I? <laughs> we were on Okinawa. We weren't on the beach. We were on board the Richard R. Arnold. And we all looked at each other. And I remember this one guy who I was very friendly with. Chris Christopherson, he was a diver 
on our ship. We had a diving unit. And he says, hey, Moose, you went to school. What do you think of this? One bomb wipes out a whole city, all this? I says, I don't know. I don't know. We've been bombing them for like a year and a half. And how can one airplane with one bomb do a thing like this? And somebody said, this is just so much bullshit. That is just so much crap. How can they expect us, even as dumb as we are, to believe this much crap? <clears throat> that they think we will swallow this crap. How can they believe we're that dumb? Dumb we are, but not that dumb. <laughs> and then, and I'll never forget this. this. This is a memory I have forever. I'll have this memory as long as I live. My brother was a dentist. Was, he's retired now. He, he was a dentist for 51 years. He was a dentist in a, in a uh, unit that was always close to where our ship went. And he had a jeep signed to him. And one day he says, we were in Japan. He says, hey, Bert, let's go take a ride up to this Hiroshima. And we got in a jeep, and we drove about two hours from Tokyo to Hiroshima. And we got up to a rise. Hiroshima is in a volcano. The whole city is in a volcano. We got to the rise and we looked down and we saw that city. And all you could see that was standing were bank vaults, which became my profession. I, was, I worked for a company that built bank vaults. 24 years and then 7 years, 31 years I was in the bank vault business. And all I could see was bank vaults with a melted vault. That's all that was standing were bank vaults. And my brother said to me, Bert, let's get the hell out of here. And we didn't, go, we didn't go down there. We just got in the Jeep and ran. It's a good thing we didn't go down there. But the sight of that city was just, it was just a sight you cannot relive. And now I've seen thousands of photographs, but it was not like seeing the city itself at that time. This was in uh, October of 45. And I didn't have my camera with me. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill after you? Oh, yeah. Started? Yeah, I went back to Columbia three more years, five years I did. Mm -hmm. But I got married, and my wife. She passed away many years ago. She said, Bert, it's a degree or a divorce. I was at a, at a full-time job, at a part-time job. I was playing ball, and I was going to school. I was doing four things. So I had to give up playing ball, and I had to give up one job and going to school. So I had one full-time job and, her, and her, her artwork, which took a lot of time. She was an accomplished artist, and she had a job. So we were just jobs, artwork, and two jobs. Did you ever use the 5220 Club? Yeah. Do you uh, join veterans organizations at no. all? No. Never did? Never. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? No. Now, I'm in contact with a bunch of guys we ride a van. We have a service of the DAV, the Disabled American Veterans, provide a service of a van from your home to the VA Medical Center in Northport. And uh, until very recently, it's been all World War II veterans and Korean veterans. But in the last couple of weeks, we're starting to get Gulf War veterans. These are 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds. We have one, he's 20 years old, a baby.
He's a baby. I have a 22-year-old grandson. I have a grandson older than this wounded vet. And this kid got run over at night by one of our own vehicles. He was lying sleeping in a camp in a campground. And his right shoulder was just demolished by the tracks of a vehicle. And he's of the Orthodox Jewish religion and his family disowned him. He lives in one of these group homes in Petrov. Group house and it's a horror the way the kid is living. And uh, he gets in the van and he just explodes over what's happening to him. Over what's going on with the VA, with his life, with the pensions, with the money, with this, that, that no girl will look at him and he's nothing. And uh, last week we picked up, he, with, in addition to him, we picked up another one who's uh, 21, 22, who was an officer in a tank outfit, who was burned. And then we got a notice in the mod, in each uh, mod they have, you know what a mod is? I'm not sure. A mod is a uh, a group is where the, where one particular class of patients, neurology, ophthalmology, internal radiology. Mm -hmm. You go to your particular area that you are being treated for, and they have magazines there, newspapers, everything. They have literature there pertaining to the services of the VA medical center, mm -hmm. and they had literature there on how to react to these new veterans, about how to, your deportment and your conduct and your language, and the fact that these are very young veterans, and we're to give them the greatest possible leeway. And the fact that it's a war we've never seen anything like before. And please remember the Veterans Administration credo. You gave, we give. They gave, we're giving. And these kids, the first time you run into them, it, it breaks your heart. And I keep thinking of my grandsons. And I keep thinking, thank God, this they're, well, they're half sweet, they're dual citizens. But they don't have to serve in the United States Armed Forces. Nobody does now. They don't have a draft. They have to enlist. How do you think your uh, time in the service affected or changed your life or do you? It didn't. All right, well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you. Thank you. We had a mail call on Okinawa. A mail call on Okinawa was a very, very strange thing. There was no mail. This I got on Okinawa. Okay, you can open it. That's my father with that belly, and my mother and my sister, and the stork is sleeping. <laughs> and notice, the sh I am on the island to the north, and my brother, the dentist, with the in syringe on bottom. The man who did this thing was a professor of dental dentistry at the University of the Philippines. He was my brother's dental assistant. Nice. And I've kept that thing since ninth July of 45. Okay, thank you. Thank you.